Welcome and thank you for joining us for part two of this Implementation Science webinar series, Increasing Scale-Up Research in Cancer Control. My name is Denise Ganip and I'll be your WebEx host. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few WebEx logistics. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the IS website in the coming weeks. All lines have been muted upon entry and will be in listen-only mode. Please submit your questions and comments by using the chat or Q&A panel and select everyone or all panelists before hitting submit. The moderators will ask them on your behalf during the Q&A discussion. You may need to activate the appropriate panel using the three dot menu found in the bottom right corner of your screen. To focus on the people who are showing videos during a meeting, go to layout in the top right corner and choose hide participants without video. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC button in the lower left corner of your screen. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. David Chambers to begin the meeting. Thanks so much, Denise, and thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, we're very excited uh, to have this opportunity to learn from these wonderful experts as they've been doing work to help us think through uh, the research agenda and just practice around uh, scale up. And so some of you may have been with us uh, a bit, a, a number of weeks ago when we had a parallel session that was concentrating on sustainability. We were learning from experiences all over the globe. Uh, and with this webinar, we're once again doing that. So we have this chance uh, to hear from Cindy Vinson, my colleague at NCI, who's really been leading our efforts in thinking about scale up research and some exciting uh, work that we've been doing. Uh, to then hear, uh, she's gonna talk a bit about a portfolio analysis that, that, that she's at the helm of. Uh, and then we get to hear from uh, two of the, the folks who have, we have been supporting uh, to, to study scale up, both uh, in the US and uh, around, the, around the world. I think what I was saying was that after hearing from Cindy, we have this great chance to, to learn from two uh, of the experts, our, our PIs within our portfolio, Drs. Buller and Subramanian, talking about their work in studying scale up. And then we get to hear from uh, Dr. Amade uh, Gogavar from the University of Laval uh, in Canada, who can, who can share uh, this wonderful work that he and colleagues have been doing, uh, concentrating on uh, reporting guidelines for scale up research. Uh, Dr. Gogovar will be able to ask a few key questions to our panelists, uh, and then we'll circle back. And please start putting in whatever questions you have for the panel as they come to you. And so we'll spend that uh, last 15 minutes or so getting through as many of those questions as we can. So again, excited, don't want to take up any more time, uh, and hope for no technological glitches. Uh, but Cindy, why don't you take it away? Thank you, David. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Excited to see many names that I recognize and some new um, folks attending. So I just want to introduce the topic that I'm going to be covering. David mentioned we conducted a portfolio analysis um, at NCI of scale-up studies. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize my colleagues who have helped me with this. So Drs. Gila Netta, um, Aubrey Villalobos, and Maggie Correa Mendez have all helped with this portfolio analysis. And we have presented a poster on this previously, but we've updated it a bit, and we're in the process of um, developing this into a manuscript. So this is really the first uh, presentation of the updated analysis. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So before I start, I want to bring everyone's attention to a new funding opportunity that both the sustaining sustainability webinar and this webinar are really kind of prep for. Um, last week, we were able to publish um, two RFAs in the NIH guide for this initiative that we are calling Scale Up and Maintaining Evidence-Based Interventions to Maximize Impact on Cancer, or SUMMIT. And what you see here is just a brief summary of this initiative. Um, we are really pushing to advance the science of scale up and sustainability, hence the two webinars, last the uh, one on sustainability and this one. Um, and we are also really focusing on this because we believe that in order to reduce um, cancer-related deaths, that we really need to be able to focus on both sustainability and scale-up. And this initiative, we decided to focus on two of the issues that are leading causes of deaths in cancer. That's lung cancer screening among populations at the highest risk for cancer, and also tobacco use treatment for cancer survivors. And this initiative is really focused on developing generalized knowledge 
on how to scale up and sustain effective cancer-related interventions. You see a brief uh, graphic here that describes the initiative of both RFAs. And in the middle, you see the strategies that we want to make sure are included in the clinical trials that will be done as part of this overarching initiative. So let's go ahead and move on to the portfolio analysis piece. So when we were doing this portfolio analysis, we started out with a definition of scale-up that we pulled from ExpandNet, which is a commonly used definition. And it's shown here, um, with this definition being the deliberate effort to increase the impact of innovations um, to benefit more people and to foster policy and program development on a lasting basis. And that was our initial definition that we used. And then we kind of dug into this as we got into our portfolio. But before we started our portfolio, I want to let you know that the reason why we decided to focus on scale-up was an initial portfolio analysis that was done by Dr. Chambers and my colleague Mindy um, Gilanetta and Mindy Klein that focused on funded grants in cancer control um, between 2006 and 2019. And in that original portfolio analysis, they identified 71 awards, but out of those 71 awards, they only identified two that were studying scale-up. So we realized that there really is a need to expand the research in scale-up, and we needed to dig into the portfolio a bit deeper to understand what we were funding. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we did adapt this definition um, as we moved forward with our summit RFAs. So I wanted to just show you an example of how we've kind of refined this definition over time. So the summit RFAs that were released last week, we took that definition from ExpandNet and we refined it so that we were looking at what are the minimum number of sites that we wanted to see that needed to be included as part of a trial to be classified as scale-up. And we settled on the number of 60, and we ran around between, you know, should it be 100, should it be 50? We came up with 60 as something that we thought was manageable, that was beyond a normal size of a regular intervention um, efficacy study, but that was really trying to move it up into something that replicated scale. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So previously, a number of research questions have been identified. A chapter that was written in a book that um, NCI led um, on advancing the science of implementation across the cancer control continuum, we had a chapter that really focused solely on scale-up and the need for advancing the research related to scale-up. And in their conclusion, they identified these six questions, research questions, that they really felt should be answered in relationship to scale-up. And this helps put our portfolio analysis in perspective. And I think it aligns really well with the work that Dr. Gogovor has been doing around um, looking at ways to um, report scale-up research questions. And the questions that they posed in that chapter focus on when is evidence enough for scaling up an intervention? Um, also, what are the barriers for scaling up? Um, how do you actually scale up something that is complex that would be inter that would be implemented in a in a in a cancer control setting? Also, looking at the impacts of scaling up, we assume that scaling up is always good, but there can be both um, positive and negative effects in multiple directions, especially focusing on health equity. Um, we also want to think about what are the specific designs, research designs, um, that are necessary for the different phases of scale-up, and what is the cost? What are the costs that are associated with scale-up? So we had these types of questions in mind as we did the portfolio analysis. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, these are the objectives that we set out for our portfolio analysis. We wanted to identify grants that had been funded um, in cancer control settings between 2005 and 2023. We focused on describing the characteristics of these research studies with the ultimate goal of helping us to identify gaps in the portfolio and to highlight opportunities for um, research. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So these were, uh, uh, this is a summary of our, our key findings here. So our study objectives, we really focused on, on a lot of different objectives, but it was important for us to know that while the original portfolio analysis that um, was highlighted at the beginning of this presentation only found two grants, we found 19. Um, if you were 
on the sustainability webinar, you knew that there were many more grants related to sustainability than to scale up. Um, of those scale up grants that we identified, 10 focused on factors associated with scale up, such as barriers and facilitators. Eight of those assessed cost and benefits, six focused on implementation strategies, and only three measured scale up as an explicit outcome. And I think this is because so much of the scale up work is new with only 19 grants funded in that time period. They're still getting their feet under them to really think about where they can go with the scale up research and what they should be measuring. And hopefully in the future, more um, outcomes will be measured in scale up research. The interventions that were included in this portfolio um, focused on prevention as the number one topic with um, seven studies focusing on screening. Five of those were on cervical cancer and four were on tobacco control. Um, in the middle to the right, you see the theories, models, and frameworks that were used with eight of the grants using CIFR. Um, and then six of them using REAIM and PRISM. It's important to note that of all of these numbers, none of them are mutually exclusive. So some grants combine CIFR with REAIM um, or other theories, models, and frameworks. And then EPIS, Diffusion of Innovation, and Proctor's IOF um, model were used in one grant each. Delivery settings where the scale-up studies focused on in our portfolio analysis are shown here. Ten grants had um, settings that were health that were healthcare settings. Um, two of the grants were classified as either workplace, community-based organizations, school or health departments. Um, six of these grants were delivered by healthcare providers, five by peer lay or healthcare peer lay healthcare providers, and four were by um, public health officials. So this is just a quick synopsis of our key findings. More will come out and you'll see more of that in our paper. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So when we were thinking about the scope, when I talked about the definition that we put a number to this, we wanted to make sure we included a little bit of what was the scope of the research. And so I went back and I looked at the 19 grants. And not six of those grants were actually conduct, conducted in lower or middle income countries. But the scope of the research really varied based on where it was at. In the United States, um, the um, grants in the US ranged from studies that were conducted in multiple health clinics in a city, such as New York City, to grants that were actually nationwide and covered all 50 states. In India, they had a study that was conducted in India's second largest state with a population of over 72 million. In Nigeria, they had two studies there, and you can see they ranged from 15 clinics in six states to eight government areas. Peru, three regions that included 36, net, 36 networks, and Rwanda had three districts serving 1.8 million individuals. And Zambia had a province with 67 clinics. So each of these studies de defined what they were looking at when they were focusing on scale-up a little bit differently. So with that, I just want to conclude and bookend this. Let's go to the next slide with a little bit of information about um, scale-up and that um, new initiative that we have called Summit. Um, we have a pre-application webinar on that initiative coming up on the 28th from 12 to 1, and we'll post the link to that in our chat section so that if anyone's interested in learning more about that initiative, they can, they can register for that webinar. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Buller, who is presenting his grant that was part of this portfolio. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, today, and good afternoon, today I've been asked to uh, present on our research on scale-up for an evidence-based occupational sun protection, skin cancer prevention and intervention throughout the United States. Next slide, please. The intervention in its current form is called Go Sun Smart at Work. It includes promoting adoption of occupational sun protection policy by managers and providing training and communication to motivate the use of effective personal sun protection by employees on the job. In our effectiveness research, our intervention was implemented using a series of meetings and follow-up communications with managers on-site face-to-face training of employees, and a large collection of policy and personal protection communication for use in the workplace. 
The behavior change strategies were based on diffusion of innovations theory, social cognitive theory, and relationship development principles when putting together the Ghosts on Smart at Work intervention. Next slide. Ghosts on Smart at Work was actually a culmination of a series of studies over a 14-year period. The initial version of Ghosts on Smart at Work was developed with a large North American outdoor recreation industry. When it demonstrated effectiveness, we studied the dissemination of the intervention within the entire outdoor recreation industry, working with the industry's professional associations. In our next two trials, we adapted it to be usable with public sector employers. We also added a policy component with the expectation that policy adoption by employers would sustain an intervention implementation. In the SunSafe Workplaces trial, we demonstrated that the Go Sun Smart at Work intervention increased the number of employers with formal written sun protection policies, increased their implementation of sun protection actions for their employees, and increased employees' sun safety practices on the job. Next slide. With these results, we obtained funding for a trial to study two methods for scaling up the occupational sun protection intervention nationwide. We also recognized that our way of implementing the intervention, relying on in-person meetings with managers and on-site face-to-face -face training of employees was very costly. It was also becoming outdated as employers were investing in digital training technologies and using online resources to create their own health and safety interventions. So we proposed to compare the cost effectiveness of two scale-up strategies in a randomized trial design. Next slide. The in-person scalability strategy was the original method for delivering the Go Sun Smart at Work intervention in the effectiveness trial. It consisted of assigning a sun safety coach to each workplace and having the coach do a series of, of activities with the managers and employees. They would meet with the managers and review their policies and procedures. They would help them adopt and modify the policies to support sun protection at work. They presented face-to-face -face occupational sun safety training to employees at the work sites and they provided managers with a collection of sun safety communications for employees, worked with managers to plan and implement the sun safety actions in the workplace, and then followed up with the managers to support implementation and troubleshoot barriers. This strategy was compared to a digital scalability strategy that virtualized all of the coaches' meetings with managers provided online video training that managers were encouraged to use with employees instead of the face-to-face -face training by our project staff, and distributed digital versions of all policy and personal protection materials and communications. In both strategies, recommendations for intervention implementation were tailored to managers' readiness to implement the occupational sun safety. The tailored advice was present, provided in a written report to the employer at the beginning of the dissemination period and guided subsequent meetings between the sun safety coach and the senior managers. Next slide. The industry we partnered with for this trial was the state departments of transportation throughout the U.S. They were affiliated with the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. The AASHTO Executive Director invited all 50 state DOTs to participate, and 21 initially agreed to participate, although two DOTs did drop out. We successfully partnered with professional associations to recruit participating employers and distribute the intervention in nearly every study that we've done on Go Sun Smart at Work. Identifying issues and vetting outside organizations is a key responsibility of these professional associations. They also have established communication channels with senior workplace managers, both of which were very valuable for our uh, researching, especially in this scale up trial. As you can see, we were able to recruit state departments of transportation throughout the U.S. with different climates and solar UV levels and was with diverse populations and workforces. Another positive was that the DOTs had similar organizational structures, job types, workplace policies, and work environments. In fact, all of the departments of transportation had state-level offices and organized their workforce into geographic regions that operated somewhat independently. 
we were able to randomize the regional districts to treat them as our units of analysis for the comparison of the two scalability strategies. Next slide. The primary analysis in this scale-up trial was focused on the cost effectiveness of the two scalability strategies. For scalability costs, we track two types of cost. First, program delivery costs, that is the, co the cost we incurred to distribute, implement, and support the Ghosts on Smart at Work intervention in the regional districts. And then second, program implementation costs, costs incurred by the regional districts themselves when implementing the intervention activities. As this figure shows, we hypothesized that the digital strategy would be more cost effective, even though we expected that it might achieve lesser implementation of the intervention than the in-person strategy. Implementation was measured by reports from managers and employees at post-test. We also measured personal sum protection by employees on the job and managers' awareness of any written sum protection policies as secondary outcomes. Next slide. Our trial has recently finished and we're working on publishing the findings. A number of insights into scaling up evidence-based programs have emerged from the trial. Among the notable findings were that it appeared possible to scale up the Ghosts on Smart at Work intervention, at least with these large employers uh, at the size of the DOTs, using either scalability method. However, the digital method was far less costly than the in-person method, which might be acceptable despite the loss in implementation. Employers may choose to use program elements that are easy to implement and low cost, such as training and communications, rather than uh, those actions that require extensive changes to the workplace or large investments, such as construction of shade structures or modified work schedules. Next slide. Research on scale-up of evidence-based programs has a number of challenges. The scale of scale-up research can be quite daunting. Our study required working with state, with 19 state DOTs and 138 regional districts, employing nearly 100,000 managers and employees in numerous locations who maintain the transportation infrastructure in half of the United States. It required partnering with trans the transportation industry to recruit the DOTs, gain access to their staff and workplaces, and retain them in the study. Our scale-up procedures carried costs to the DOTs that we did not have the funds to defray, which were barriers for an both initial recruitment and retention. While we had done extensive research to develop an intervention that was usable by private and public employers in our previous research, we still needed to adapt program elements in this trial. We adapted them to the DOT industry, such as the hierarchical organization of state offices and regional districts that had a large influence on the policy adoption process, and to secular changes in the American workplace, such as increased cybersecurity and the advent of learning management software platforms that cause us to modify the training and communication. Finally, I can't understate the impact of environmental influences in this scale-up trial. DOTs, by the scope of their responsibility, manage environmental events and disasters that can shift organizational priorities rapidly and affect access to the work sites, managers, and employees, and their commitment to the trial. And all American employers had to cope with the COVID pandemic that occurred in the middle of the trial. While DOTs were essential workers during the pandemic, face-to-face -face training was suspended and replaced by digital training, meeting areas were closed, visits from outside entities were prohibited, and substantial numbers of managers and employees left the work sites. We restarted scale up when possible as DOT workplaces reopened, but the pandemic response undoubtedly interfered with program implementation. Next slide. We are continuing to work on scale-up and dissemination of the Ghosts on Smart at Work intervention. We've designed recently a fully automated turnkey digital platform for disseminating Ghosts on Smart at Work that eliminates the need for sun, the sun safety coach and uses smart bot technology instead to tailor the intervention to employers' readiness to implement. This study is supported by NCI SBIR funds. We are also adapting the skin cancer prevention advice for employees with darker pigmented skin, most commonly Hispanic and African American workers, to make the intervention more equitable in its application and more broadly 
acceptable to employers. This project is a collaboration with the colleagues at Emory University's Prevention Research Center with funding from CDC. Final slide. As I close, I want to thank Cindy and David for inviting me to speak on our scale up research and acknowledge many of my colleagues and staff who have made our research a success. I look forward to answering any questions. Thanks. Thank you, David. So um, happy to be here to present our work. So um, I'm going to talk to you all about scaling up interventions to address uh, the cervical cancer burden. So I'll be specifically talking about our studies in Zambia and also Kenya. Uh, next slide, please. So. The unequal burden of cervical cancer, as you all know, low and middle income countries have the highest burden uh, from cervical cancer. Um, as seen in this map here, the dark areas are where the burden of can cervical cancer is the highest. So 90% of the new cases are diagnosed in the LMIC setting, um, but more importantly, uh, in the LMIC setting is where there is lower prevention and screening uptake, which makes obviously the studying the scale up of cervical cancer uh, prevention and screening in these settings uh, vitally important. Next slide. So here is just a snapshot of the WHO 2030 acceleration plan for cervical cancer elimination. Um, as you can see here, the goal is to have 90% of girls fully vaccinated with an HPV vaccine, 70% uh, of women screened using a high quality test, uh, similar to an HPV DNA test, and then 90% of women receive treatment for precancerous lesions. So all of this 90, 70, 90 goals here require significant, significant scale up of prevention, early diagnosis, and treatment services. But of course, as you can see here, it can avert a large number of cervical cancer deaths and definitely something vital to do. Next slide. While I was putting together these slides, I was challenging myself really to think about, yeah, about scale up work. And really, as David has also pointed out, it really builds on a series of lessons learned and a series of awards. So I've just put a snapshot here of the awards that our team um, and our set of collaborators have been working in sort of along the cancer screening continuum or prevention and screening continuum here. And it's important to add that scale up research, although it's hard, very important to do, but even when something is scaled up, the work doesn't always, is not always done. We do realize that adaptations have to happen, and that's really some of the work we're doing. So I'm going to talk to you today about iScale, one of the studies that we did in Zambia, which actually looked at a scale up project and scale up program and evaluated that and also talk to you about lessons learned from there and how we moved on to C3Link, which is the study we're doing in Kenya, to build on the lessons learned and to adapt for the scale up in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So just providing you a little bit of detail about these two studies. So iScale um, is being completed, occurred 2016 to 2021. This was in Zambia. We were really looking at the processes, preferences, and the financial aspects of scale-up. Zambia had launched a very successful cervical cancer screening program, and it was scaling up and being implemented across the country. And we were piggybacking on this sort of very important processes in place in Zambia to really understand the scale-up process and to offer lessons for other African settings. So the screening took place in healthcare facilities, and the screening was offered through using visual inspection with acetic acid, so VIA. And the strategies were mass media to get the information out. There was also outreach by clinic staff, and there was a lot of provider training. Um, and we did the assessment using REAIM, and I'll share some of those findings as we move along. But C3Link is built on the lessons learned from iScale, so we're doing an implementation trial to assess an integrated approach to support scale up, so integrating cervical cancer screening with breast cancer screening. We're working in a little bit more controlled settings, so three counties in Kenya. Uh, we are moving from VIA, now adapting HPV DNA testing, which Zambia is too in its um, scaled up version of its um, 
um, screening program, but we are moving to doing HPV self-sampling uh, supported by community health promoters in C3 Link. Um, and the strategies we are using is group and individual education, navigation support, and practice facilitation. And we're using the Proctor framework in our assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a map of Zambia, and what we're showing here is in light green is where the VIA facilities were set up, and in dark green is where both VIA and LEAP services were available. Um, LEAP is the loop ex um, electrosurgical excision procedure that you would need to um, for any, um, um, I guess, precancerous lesions. So you can see that in terms of scale up, this is looking at a snapshot in 2019, Zambia had done a fantastic job scaling up across the country. And this was really seen as a model and it's still today. Many of these areas are still functional, but as I'll show you, there are some um, barriers to or challenges in the scale up. And one of the challenges is really, even if you build a capacity and screening was generally offered free, but there are still some costs to women to attend the screening. Um, you know, as you all know, travel costs. There's also a small cost in terms of registering at a clinic, and those did prove to be barriers. So we did an uh, assessment along with the Ministry of Health. Um, please, next slide. And I'm just going to present those findings for you. We did a series of qualitative and quantitative uh, data collection, but this is a quick snapshot on the major lesson we learned. And the major lesson is really that we need to involve the partners of the women. So you see here, so we're looking at the factors impacting the decision to screen, looking at females and also looking at male respondents. Uh, what you see in yellow is exceedingly important factor, important. What you see in green is fairly important, and what you see in blue is not as important. Um, when you compare the females to the males, you can see for the males, the factors that are exceedingly important are related to the cost and the clean and high quality facilities. Uh, when we explode the clean and high quality facilities a little bit further, this is actually a reflection of a lot more than just the facilities. It's also a reflection of the quality of the providers, quality of the care, perception of the quality of the care. But clearly there are differences in how males and females perceive these factors. Um, and one of the takeaways is that in all our future studies, we have been involving the partners of the women in our education sessions, in all the decision making, because clearly this is important and we do know that when it comes to certain decisions, it's either a joint or the males in many of the family situations do have a very uh, strong voice. So we wanted to make sure they're engaged. So that's a learning for the future. And um, next slide, please. While we were work focusing on cervical cancer, um, Zambia did expand and also offer HPV vaccination for 14-year-old girls. So not that we have planned to incorporate this, but again, adaptation of our own research. So we did incorporate the HPV vaccination and evaluated that as part of our study. So here's some data that is from the Zambian Ministry of Health. In 2019, they did a really great job doing Child Health Week and a cohort of 14-year-olds were vaccinated. You can see the uptake here across various provinces. Um, overall, more than 250,000 uh, 250, 250, girls were vaccinated. And this was, in terms of the target number reached, about 76% were reached. So it was seen as a real success. So behind this, obviously, this is just one dose. Absolutely fine, as you know, with the new WHO guidelines that came out in 2022, single vaccine uh, dose of HPV vaccine it seems to be protected. But Zambia has a country with a lot of young girls and women living with HIV. For, for those, multiple doses are required, and this program did not really uh, follow through to offer that. So obviously, some challenges, but this vaccination is a super success and Zambia has continued to expand and is actually targeting a larger cohort of 9 to 14 year olds, but vaccination alone is not going to um, at least lead towards the elimination of cervical cancer in the near future because these impacts take a long term, long term to actually um, have an impact on reduction of the risk. 
So next slide, please. So here's a snapshot of the iScale results. So in terms of reach, since 2006, about 1.5 million, million women have been screened using BIA. Um, Zambia is moving towards HPV, uh, HPV DNA screening, and uh, uh, quite a cohort of women have already been screened. But still, the uptake remains low. In general, it's about 26%. Um, this is in contrast, of course, with the HPV uh, vaccinations, which are a much higher percent, um, as we see earlier, about 75%. In terms of the effectiveness, we were mainly focusing on the Lusaka province. Uh, we did see that 76% of all of normal screens received treatment. But when we look outside of the Lusaka setting, there are gaps in the data. But our landscape analysis identified several gaps in terms of diagnostic test completion and also treatment referral. Zambia has one major cancer treatment facility, which is based in the Lusaka area. So it is difficult to access it from the other regions and areas. So that was a major barrier. Although we did a lot of modeling work and, um, and we did collect a lot of cost data as well uh, from the ground, and screening would be highly cost effective. And obviously, uh, even at scale up, um, it would be highly cost effective because there are serious economies of scale uh, when we looked at the Zambian setting. But again, there's other data in terms of adop adoption by, say, providers. Um, we didn't have great data, really, to look at acceptability and satisfaction. But there are challenges in implementation because we know that BIA and we've been following is very operator dependent. And so there were quality issues in terms of um, you know, missed signs of early cervical cancer, et cetera. And there was high staff turnover. So it was very difficult to maintain the overall quality of the program. Um, and then finally, of course, the cost of screening generally tends to be a barrier with individuals. We did a large discrete choice experiment. Um, we found this to be an issue, a key factor, but two-thirds were willing to pay uh, a smaller moderate price. And the Damian Ministry of Health wanted us to, with collaborating with us on this analysis, really wanted to understand sort of, you know, whether they could have some cost sharing um, capacity to really support their scale up financially. The next slide, please. So jumping very quickly to talk about the C3 link. So the lessons learned from um, iScale are really that, you know, just having screening in the, in the healthcare facilities were not really reaching the women. So in C3 link, we're actually taking the screening to the community. So we're doing self-sampling and HPV DNA testing. We're using community health promoters to work with the women. So our, our hope is that we have the social ecological model related barriers, the individual or interpersonal and structural levels. We hope that we will be able to address those with a C3 link sort of intervention of being in the community and also with education um, and other strategies to be able to sort of not only build up self-confidence, cancer knowledge, stigma reduction, sort of at the, at the level of the individuals and the community, but really enforce high quality screening, which was one of the barriers in the Zambian scale up, and really figure out a way to have the provider skills and referrals sort of built in so they could be scaled up as well. Um, and of course, we are hoping that these will move forward to uh, affecting these mediating outcomes that you can see here and improve overall cancer outcomes. We are doing a very detailed implementation outcomes assessment uh, using the CIFA framework and the Proctor model. And then we will be doing an economic evaluation of these activities as well. So the way we've designed this is that we have now completed a pre-implementation phase, which is really readiness in the three counties we're working in. Uh, we are at implementation right now, and we will move to maintenance, where we are going to step back as a researchers and allow the counties to take over. They are very integrated with our work, and this is part of our effort to sort of scale up from the very beginning. And then we would love to move forward to scale up. And um, again, we will not be there from this study to do that, but we are very much engaged with our partners on the ground, and actually the WHO is also working in these settings to do a similar integrated effort, so we hope that will all offer synergies. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one key aspect here, just to quickly touch base, is how we are 
what we are comparing. We are comparing our C3 Link Core, which is the community health promoter, and we're doing clinic practice facilitation, which we see as sort of low resource, low effort type of activities with more intensive effort activity in our C3 uh, Link Plus. Um, strategies, which includes one-on-one -on -one education, motivational interviewing, and navigation, which is definitely more expensive. And we're comparing all, both of these packages with a standard of care, which is just um, sort of more education. But our hypothesis here is that package two will be far more expensive than package one. And we really want to support scale up by understanding, is it really worth the resources to move into package two, or do we remain at package one? So it, it, I'm sure we may have excellent results with package two, but it's going to really depend in terms of the cost effectiveness of both these approaches and also the affordability. So last slide. So I wanted to leave you with the scale of challenges and opportunities. So really looking across along the continuum of care here, you all know there are several barriers, you know, it, whether it's the quality that we've mentioned, whether it's the delay in moving um, through the continuum and sort of missed opportunities. But it's also important to, so obviously scaling up these, there can be even more challenges, especially in rural areas where we know referrals and other processes can be uh, lead to additional barriers. But the strategies themselves, I think it's important to understand sort of community engagement or provider training or strengthening referrals, they themselves also could face challenges at scale up. And some of these scale easier than others. Uh, we realize that even provider trainings, when you are doing telemedicine, you need a lot more specialists if you're trying to scale up, and that's often not available in the setting. So a different model is probably more effective at scale up. But there are facilitators, so I want to leave this on a positive note. We are finding that integration of services can be a good model, uh, yet to be seen, but we are moving forward with that. Partnership for health system strengthening is another key area and really important. Leadership support, especially from the Ministry of Health and the counties, are super important. And we're seeing more and more collaborative funding, which we're very excited about because this avoids silos and allows people and partners to work together. Thank you. Good day, good afternoon, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, in this important uh, webinar on Scaling Up as a discussion. And uh, I will uh, provide you with a brief overview of the development of the Succeed Reporting Guideline. And uh, uh, so please, the next slide. And so I would like to start by defining what the reporting guideline is so that we all are on the same page. Uh, it's defined as a checklist, a flow diagram, or explicit text to guide the authors in reporting a specific type of research, uh, usually developed using an explicit methodology. And so reporting guidelines are used uh, uh, when you writing up for the result of research. It can be used uh, when you are preparing the protocol because it, it reminds you of the important items that need to be uh, considered. But I need to precise that the uh, report guidelines are not methodological uh, guides. So um, if you are using a specific type of design, you have to refer to the methodological guide of that study design. Next slide, please. And so, why did we develop uh, the Succeed Reporting Guideline? Uh, adequate reporting of studies is essential, it's crucial to ensure the transparency, um, the reproducibility, and, and also for ensuring that the result is translated into practice, into policy making, and even future uh, research. Um, but gaps uh, uh, on uh, uh, quality reporting of research uh, were well documented, including in the field of scale up, as uh, highlighted by a systematic review conducted by members of our team. And so, and no standards were uh, available to report scaling studies, so we registered the development of SUCCEED with the Equator Network, 
It's a network that compiles the um, reporting guideline of uh, health research and also support the development, the um, dissemination and the implementation of uh, reporting guideline. Next slide, please. And so uh, to develop, the, there are uh, recommended steps to be followed and so we are there to the step uh, to develop a reporting guideline by the Equator Networks. And so the main steps are, are highlighted on this slide. Uh, first, we established an executive committee to oversee the development process. Uh, we identify relevant items through uh, literature review. And then the next step is to prioritize the item, the potential items using a consensus process. And uh, uh, then uh, after that, the final list of items are pilot tested. And then the last step is the dissemination. Of course, it's not the last because uh, after the uh, publication, there are a lot of uh, activities that need to be done, including endorsement, training, evaluation, and uh, even update of the report Ghana, depending on how the research are moving. And so, uh, next slide. Yeah, so I, I just want to show you the um, an image of the checklist because the report Ghana mainly are uh, checklists that the authors follow to uh, adequately report their research. And, and I highlighted that, uh, of course, uh, sustainability research is very important here at the NCI. And so I highlighted that there is an item of the succeed reporting checklist on sustainability. So I want to thank uh, the, um, the next slide, please. I want to thank uh, all the funding agencies, uh, the members of the Succeed Group and partners, and of course you for your attention. So I think uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, to uh, ask a few questions and then uh, uh, also have some from the audience. Um, my first question will go to uh, Dr. Vincent. Um, by showing the, the analysis of the portfolio uh, you mentioned, especially for, I think, uh, during the first period that uh, only two out of 71 awarded uh, grant study scale up. So I want to know if, the, uh, uh, what do you think are the main reasons for this underrepresentation of scale up research in cancer control grants? So I, I don't have a, a well-informed answer to that. I have a gut reaction to that, being that I think that our, our research that we funded at NCI has really been funded in implementation science earlier in the implementation process. Um, so when you look at the portfolio, you know, we are looking more at studying implementation, adaptation, and the further you get along towards sustainability and scale up, the numbers drop. So I think that since implementation science is a relatively new field and relatively new as a funding opportunity at NCI, scale up just has not been funded. And also I think all of you have mentioned Studying scale-up is difficult. It's not, it's not something for the faint of heart. You have to look at the size and the complexity of scale-up. So I, we want to push the research in the direction of studying scale-up. And I think the more that we can learn from presentations like this will help us move in that direction. OK, thank you very much. Um, I think I will have a question that will be mainly direct to my colleague, uh, David and uh, Suja. Uh, justification for scaling, uh, for scale up, uh, is based on the strength of uh, evidence, consideration of positive and negative in impact, and how it addresses uh, equity, 
uh, while assessing who or what will be affected and how. So how do these factors influence the decision to scale in the project that you uh, presented? Um, in terms of, of either the effectiveness or the equity, which are that e either one. Okay. Yeah. Either one, um, you can address yeah. one aspect and, uh, uh, your colleague can address another aspect. I mean, it's it, in, in our work, it's hard to get away from the fact that we're dealing with a, a disease that is primarily a disease of, of Caucasian European, uh, ancestry individuals uh, because they are much higher risk than uh, some of the other uh, groups who have more natural melanin in the skin and darker pigmentation. Uh, but that said, we have um, always taken the approach that part of what we teach to employers as well as employees is that risk levels vary and they vary based on uh, th on the sun sensitivity of the skin and so that uh, as you move into po uh, employed populations with darker skin types, their risk levels are different, uh, lower, and they maybe need to be more concerned with vitamin D uh, synthesis as opposed to simply sun protection. Um, and we have always trained on that, uh, although I will say that in this scale-up project, we were uh, pushed by a couple of the employers to be even more uh, extensive in our discussion of the differences, uh, particularly when it came to employers with African-American uh, workforces, because uh, we had done a lot of our work in the Western U.S. where Hispanics are the pr predominant minority group, uh, and so that also why we took advantage of the CDC funding to uh, work even more on adaptation for that to make it much more equitable and acceptable because most employers, if they adopt a training or something or program, they want it to apply broadly to everyone in their workforce. Okay. What about you, uh, Suzanne? Well, thanks for that question. So I guess at least in the cervical cancer realm, the interventions, if you would, the vaccination of the screenings are highly effective. So that part I think we have that is uh, very, very good and, and uh, great for implementation and scale up. Um, and, but in terms of equity, how we address that is we were really implementing in settings which have the highest risk factors. So for example, in Lusaka, we were in the government facilities that were actually catering to communities with have high risk of those either acquiring HIV or those already living with HIV. So that's kind of how we targeted. And I think to David's point, it's not that we were, in, in any case, we were not implementing the intervention to just a specific cohort. It was for the entire facility, the entire community that the facility served. But these were all, you know, high risk communities and generally low income communities. So I think in those terms, we were really targeted in trying to address um, equity. Uh, thank you very much. I want to pass on one last question and uh, because we have not enough time. Uh, one of the key deficiencies in reporting scaling studies uh, is unclear distinction between the evidence informed uh, intervention and the scale up strategy that you to scale it up. Uh, so I in your study, I just wonder if you can quickly uh, uh, say if do you foresee any uh, challenges or uh, difficulty to uh, that might affect your ability to report those two type of uh, component in in your research, and uh, also I think. Uh, that Vincent also can answer why you mentioned that only three grants explicitly measure scale up as an outcome. Uh, so uh, what challenges did the research face in measuring scale up uh, as a strategy or as an out outcome? So if uh, each of you can provide a brief uh, answer, and then uh, I will uh, pass on to David to, to look at uh, the chat box. Thank you. Suja, why don't you take that first? Go ahead. Okay, I will. So in terms of a scale up, well, we were really trying to assess reach. So reach, we were generally able to do quite well. 
But the problem is reach is just reach if you're looking at screening along the continuum. Most of the cases, the problems are sort of the referrals for the abnormals. So a key lesson learned is reach is great just in terms of screening, but overall quality of the screening is key. And being able to measure and look at those, um, I guess, the diagnostic processes for those with abnormal screens is really important. So quality as well as the reach. And I would, I would echo that. I mean, we were interested, obviously, in reach, but we were particularly interested in how well would they implement the variety of, of aspects of the program, uh, and particularly how could we make that less costly, because uh, we were very concerned that while we had effectiveness in our, uh, in our effectiveness trial, that it might not be uh, practically uh, attractive to groups that might be involved in actually implementing such an intervention uh, to be sending their staff all over the country, particularly given the ge geographic uh, span, you know, spans that we had to cover on that. And so, uh, you know, were we going to lose it? Because we're always concerned as we scale up that we will lose fidelity and lose total implementation levels as we do that. Maybe I'll jump in here. So thanks so much. So, so much great information uh, and, and realizing that we only have a couple more minutes. I did want to hit on a couple of questions, one of which actually uh, is related back, Amade, to, to the reporting guidelines that you quickly ran through. But, but uh, maybe an, a question for, for uh, Suja or, or David. Um, when you think about the different models and frameworks that feel particularly helpful for scale up that might be able to be used across different settings, across different levels, what comes to mind? So questioning any models you would suggest from your experience that have been salient to, to, to see as a sort of theoretical basis. Uh, Suja, anything come to mind? Well, I would just, I'll comment on just the outcome side and sort of the evaluation. Re-AIM is easy to implement or easy to understand, and it's easy to compare with other settings. So over to you, David. Thanks. Yes. I mean, we, we relied on re-AIM as well. I mean, we, we've been relying on diffusion of innovations for 20 years in our project. Another one that we've recently been working with, uh, particularly on the policy side, is Bullock's model on policy implementation. And some of that could be applied in a workplace, but it could be applied in public environments like, you know, how do you get policy shifts, say, in a municipality, and then who's important as that policy is rolling out? on this. And so, you know, since we've been interested in both policy and uh, health education, that I think is also another one. There's no one model I can think of that's going to cover the, the field on this because sustainability needs so many components. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. And let me sneak in one more question, then we'll turn it over to, to Denise to, to carry us out. But uh, a really great question about universality versus context specific, right? So, uh, does something come to mind for, for any of you that feels like a universal determinant of success and scale up uh, versus this idea, no, actually everything is pretty much, you know, context specific. So what universal? I'm, I'm looking at Dave and then, and then Suja. You know, I, I think one of the things, and it's one of the, and maybe it's because we started out looking at this, is cost matters. I mean, whether you're talking about the cost to us as the implementers or the cost to these employers who are the recipients that we expect them to do this, and there's both things we can defray for them, but they're, they're going to take on costs. And we often got those questions, both immediate costs of what are you asking us to invest, but also what's this going to do to us for healthcare costs long term, or is someone going to be upset? in this case that the occupational exposure to UV may be caused to skin cancer. And so cost is a huge issue as we roll these things out into many, many organizations. Gotcha, Suja. I'm gonna say really the community context and engagement. Um, I think that's required in almost any setting any, anywhere we do implementation. Of course, the context of that engagement may differ, but it's universal. Well, can I just chime in real yeah. quick? Because the summit initiative that you'll be able to join the webinar on the 28th, I think that one of the main goals of that is to really start to unpack and understand what are some of the common um, factors in scale up so that it's not in one setting, in one cancer, every, you know, that we have to do it one by one, but what are some common lessons that we can learn across 
some of these studies to develop some of those commonalities. Okay, great. So I would like to think that thanks to the generosity of, of, of each of you over the past hour uh, and uh, maybe, you know, more questions that you have stimulated within this great group, if there are any follow-up questions that folks might be able to reach out and, and, and get those answered. Sure. Sure. Okay, perfect. So thanks to the four of you. Let me turn this back to Denise to, to close us out. Thank you everyone for your participation today. An archive of today's session will be available in the coming weeks on the IS website. The link is in the chat. And if you missed part one of this series, Advancing Sustainability Research in Cancer Control, you can visit the website that again is in the chat to learn more. We hope to see you at our next IS website. Have a great rest of your day. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, Cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.